Good Friday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and it is our last episode of our Transgender in Alberta week on the show, where we're talking with uh, transgender Albertans from here in Calgary and across the province about issues facing them, but also their story, because I, I'm learning. I hope people who are listening this week are learning as well. And this is going to be a great episode with another great guest, and that is Ari Rombo. Ari, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, so I've I started my interview off with the exact same question all this week, and you're no exception. Who is Ari Rombo? Oh, dang. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go right it's for the loaded, jugular. It's a, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I am an actor. I work, uh, in Calgary. I've, I've worked as an actor in Calgary, uh, since about 2006. Uh, I'm a parent, uh, to two wonderful kids. Um, and, uh, and I really value my, my family, um, more than anything. I really amazing supportive partner as well. Um, I was born in Calgary, but grew up in Southern Ontario, Uh, came back to uh, spend the rest of like the latter half of my like high school years in Banff. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I guess that's it. (laughs) Which is great, which is great. But first, before I even go into a little bit more, I got to ask because I'm an Ontario boy, we're in Southern Mm. Ontario. St. Catharines. Yes, I know it well. I have family in St. Catharines, so I know it quite well. Yeah. Niagara region, come on. Um, oh, yeah. So where does your story start? Because that is the main goal of this week, is to learn the process that one has to first figure out for themselves to, before they can start telling other people that they are transgender. Where does your story start? Um, I guess, you know, one of the things I, um, I recognized fairly early on when I was a kid was just that I certainly didn't appreciate gendered um, uh, conditioning um, while I was assigned female at birth. And I really enjoyed a lot of things that are, you know, quote unquote, associated with being a little girl. Um, There were also a lot of things that I, I liked to do that weren't associated with that. And, and how much of a struggle it was to participate in those things that weren't um, (laughs) typically or stereotypically associated with my, my gender at birth. Um, and how confusing that was for me. I think a lot of cis girls experience that. I think a lot of cis boys experience that too. And did I know at the time that that was, uh, that that could possibly lead to me being transgender in the future? No, I had no idea. Um, You know, and growing up in St. Catharines, I, it's not like I, I had any open trans friends as a kid and I didn't have uh, openly trans adults around me. So I didn't know, I just didn't know that that was an option. Um, So, and one of the things I do try to um, remind people of is that like, similarly to the the movement for, for gay rights, there seems to be this kind of obsession with us being born a certain way and that it's something we can't help. And that's true. It's not like people fake being gay or being trans. Um, that's, that's obviously not a thing, but we are a complex uh, amalgamation of conditioning, you know, what our body, what our bodies are when we're born, um, uh, environment, uh, all these things culminate in us being who we are when we come out. And, 
there's always a spectrum there's even like a often people say there's like a spectrum to sexuality well there's a spectrum spectrum to being trans as well and um because there's been this uh this hyper focus on you know little some like a little kid who's been assigned female at birth for instance knowing from the time they were four that they were a boy well that actually wasn't my experience at all um and you know part of the reason that that's not my experience is because i'm non-binary but also because we don't have to experience gender dysphoria as a child for it to be valid person can experience gender dysphoria at any time in their life anytime. So a lot, you know, I, I do try to remind myself and, and other people that like real gender dysphoria didn't kick in for me. I had, a, I had a little bit in puberty for sure, for sure, but I didn't start really having um, dysphoric experiences until I was in my twenties. So it's not, you know, <laughs> everybody's experience is different and there is no one single way that uh you know being transgender is being transgender i i'm going to assume and i should i know you should you should never assume that you and i are relatively the same age because i, I think if i did my math correctly i think you and i are relatively the same age um we grew up in an era where there was no role models for transgender people, for gay people, for lesbian uh, on TV or even in the news. Um, as an actor, as someone who is publicly out there, do you feel somewhat of a responsibility? And th I, this, this episode is gonna go in a completely different way than I thought it was going to, but I'm glad that I'm, it's, we're having this conversation. Do you feel responsible to be a voice that kids who are potentially struggling like you might have struggled or kids who all this week who we've had guests on who talked about their growing up struggled to be that role model that you didn't have as a child? Um, well, you bringing up the industry that I'm in is, is, <laughs> is of a particular um, interest because my industry is highly gendered right? Similar to sports, yeah. acting is a very, very, very gendered business. Um, and obviously there's, um, there's gender discrimination in all industries, but it's one of the only industries where uh, like your job title is gendered, actress, actor, uh, you know, you're, where, whereas you would never say like lawyeress or doctoress or you know, like yeah. you would never, you'd never gender a term for any other profession. You're just a pilot or a nurse or a doctor. Um, you, so obviously wanting to be an actor as young as I wanted to get into the industry did deeply influence the trajectory of my transition. Um, and yeah, and I and I would say that it's it's not that there were there were no uh, role models we had. It's just like it was it was this tiny space sort of carved out specifically for the the queer community in pop culture. So like when I grew up, Katie Lang was like a big deal to me. I even like kind of look like her right now, like with like, the haircut that I have for the show. It's really hilarious. Um, because she was an open lesbian, um, but, but at the same time that she was this open lesbian and I knew that, and I appreciated that. And I also was like super attracted to her, um, like had like a mega crush on her. You know, I also knew that my grandfather, who was a musician, stopped listening to her music when she came out. You know, so you have the, the, this constant back and forth or push pull of feeling like you found something or a community or, a, or feeling like you're a part of something only for it to kind of get down by the people around you or the circumstances and then uh, any empowerment you might gain from that, that person or that experience just kind of gets uh, squashed down. And I think that probably describes a lot of queer experiences. 
I, th I think it truly does because you, you mentioned a few things that when, and I, I remember sometimes when someone would come out, my father or my grandfather or my parents, uh, like my relatives would say, we're not listening to that person or we're not watching that person anymore because they've come out. Yeah. Hopefully in today's society that has changed. And uh, I, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you think it has? As, an, as a uh, person in the entertainment business, do you believe that you are passed over for roles potentially because you are transgender? Or do you think that you were given a fair equal opportunity because we are in a 2022 world now? Yeah, no, I don't think I get a fair opportunity at all. Like, like I've, I've only been out, um, like I started my medical transition. Um, I'm trying to think not too long ago, like it's really recent. Like I, I started taking hormones and I, uh, you know, got on the wait list for top surgery uh, just this past summer. So it's like really fresh. Well, maybe oh, wow. not the summer, some, some, some only a few months ago, I was definitely like <clears throat> dipping my toes in a little bit by, you know, mentioning that I'm genderqueer. I started doing drag about three years ago. Um, you know, there were, there were things that were happening that were sort of like, I was sort of signaling that like my gender is not just this one binary thing. Um, and of course, what that meant is that I, I cut my hair, which I hadn't done, uh, in years and years and years, because, uh, if you want to work as a woman in the industry, you have to have like long hair. That's just like a given. Um, and which it shouldn't be, but it is. Uh, <clears throat> and I would say that the opportunities for auditioning and film and TV have, have just screeched to a halt. You, just so haven't had any. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. So I did do a bit of research on you, which I traditionally try not to. Uh, you have had some <laughs> some TV roles in uh, mm -hmm. in one Calgary production that is in its third season. I think you were in the first two seasons of Jan, the TV show. Yeah, yeah, and I and I did do season three, which just aired. I think they just had their um, their season finale uh, a few days ago. <clears throat> yeah, and. The, and the truth is, I like I was cast before I was out as as trans, just when I was like out as a queer person, um, and and Jan and I hit it off really well because, you know, she's she's one of us and she's featuring her, her queerness is just like a natural part of the show, um, and I'm I'm so glad that she is sharing that part of herself. You know, speaking of 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 people we can look up to. Um, so they've just integrated that into the show that she has, uh, she dates men, she dates women. And, um, and that particular production is just really supportive of people that they, um, they've had on, on uh, the show since the first season. I'm not the only one who uh, got asked back a few times, you know, and I, but Jan is like, Jan as a show and Jan as a person are extraordinary people. Yeah. They are, ex they're extremely supportive. Um, I, I can't say that that extends to the, the rest of industry. the industry. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I, I want to go back here for a second because you, you've been mentioning a few times that you, uh, you sort of relatively are new to the transition, your transition. It sounds like mm -hmm. you publicly have been open about it for a few years now, but, uh, and this might be an inappropriate question to ask, and I, and I apologize if it is. When, when was the aha moment? The aha moment of, 
I need to do this. I need to do this to make myself happy. Um, <clears throat> I, my, my partner and I just had our second child 16 months ago. And I think I knew while I was pregnant the second time that one, it was going to be the last time and that the, the pregnancy was affecting me in ways that were, it was reaching much deeper than my first pregnancy. And I was having a lot of uh, dysphoric experiences about my body changing and my hormones and, um, you know, knowing that I was going to nurse my baby uh, after they were born. Um, and that all happened during lockdown. <laughs> so like my baby was born July 12th, 2020. Wow. So even though we were like open for summer or whatever, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was still in a pandemic and, and I had just gone through four or five months of, of lockdown. And, uh, and after I gave birth to him, that was when I was like, I really, I need now, now that my body has served that other purpose that was so important to me, which was having kids. I really need to like reclaim my body for myself and do something that makes me feel uh, whole again. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is the, these are the tricky questions that I, I, I want to ask and I'm going to try and uh, ask them in an appropriate way. You say reclaim. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. What does that actually mean? Because I, I'm thinking, okay, you need to reclaim something, but did you lose it? Like, was there a moment during that pregnancy where you thought, this is it, this is the last one, I've done it, I'm happy, I've given birth to my second uh, child, mm -hmm. it's now, to, now time to worry about myself. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of exactly what it is like okay. um you know one of the one of the reasons why i i believe so strong in body autonomy for like abortion rights reproductive rights as well as trans rights is because we really need the autonomy and the agency to say this is what i'm going to do with my body i want to have kids now or i don't or i want to change my body this way or whatever and and the thing is like obviously being trans doesn't begin and end with a medical transition. Like my transness isn't any more valid than a person who, who never decides to medically transition. It's just that I had to acknowledge that I had, that, that for years and years and years, I had really been um, looking in the mirror and not seeing the body I thought that I, I should have, or that belong to me. It, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to describe, but it's like looking at a different person. And even now that I'm like, I, um, my body's changing on hormones and I've, you know, I've changed my hair and, and in some ways I've changed how I dress. Uh, I also feel in some ways, like I'm looking at a body <laughs> that I don't, I don't know anymore. Like I was saying to someone recently, I was like, I don't know how to dress my body anymore. Cause it's like, it's changing so rapidly. I can't, um, I don't know what clothes like fit or how, and, and I'm like hesitant to buy new clothes right away. Cause I feel like it, my body is still going to go through a lot more, uh, changes. And obviously having been pregnant, my body had already gone through a massive transformation. So, um, but I think finally this time it's like those, those pictures I saw, I, I was sort of like stockpiling of like trans men or or sometimes like cis men in drag uh and and topless photos with flat chests and stuff like all of those things that I was like I was like obsessing over I feel like I'm getting closer and closer to having on you know one of the funny things that I talked about with my gender counselor uh when I was pregnant was how it was really hard for me to figure out for a while whether the bodies that I was like idolizing or, or feeling like a connection to, whether I was attracted to them 
or if I wanted it for myself. I couldn't figure out what it was, um, which is apparently a very common experience. The moment you put it, put it in your head and you say, okay, we're, I'm doing this. This is going to happen. Who's the first person you tell? Is it your partner at the time? Is it your family members? What is the process of coming out? Because that is the most challenging part because uh, I grew up in an era when I came out, uh, my father didn't take kindly to it and he burnt our house down with me in it. So it wasn't a good experience, but I can imagine someone coming out. Do you mean to... metaphorically or no, do you no. mean literally? Literally, literally burnt the, house. He... burnt the house down. I was in it, burnt the house down. Oh yeah, I'm good. I'm good. We're good. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, we're good. God. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad you're alive. Yeah, that was Ontario. That's why I'm out in Alberta. <laughs> oh, yeah, you came to the, a great place. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll talk about that in a few seconds. But metaphorically, your house gets burnt down a little bit here too, because the people you now have to tell that you are going to transition. Now you have to rely on them that they are going to still love you the way that they loved you beforehand. Was it easy? Mm -hmm. Was it hard? Because you talked oh. about your grandfather who said, I'm never listening to KD Lang again, but he's your grandfather. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and actually my grandfather, my grandfather was a, an extraordinarily tough individual to have in the family. Um, but he died a long time ago. So a lot of the family kind of became themselves after he died. Um, I was not the first trans person in my family. Oh, wow. So there was at least this sort of, um, you know, but I did, I did see how the, um, the, the family kind of reacted to it. And, uh, you know, and for the sake of their privacy, like, I'm not going to talk about, I'm going to try and limit like how much I say about that person, but, um, but obviously after coming out, they started to thrive in ways that they weren't before. Um, but I, I was the first adult and I, there's still family members who don't, who don't know. Like, I just don't say it. Like, we just don't talk about it. Um, and, and, and in fact, I actually told a few family members before I told my parents, um, my part with my partner, it's, it's not so much that like with my partner, my partner and I have been together for 13 years. We got married after five weeks of knowing each other. So that's like another fun story <laughs> I'll tell you another time. Um, I thought, our, yeah, like I thought I mine really and my husband's was like a short period of six months. Five weeks is okay. You've got us. Pete. No, five weeks. Yeah. No, five weeks, five weeks from, from the first date. Uh, and, and like, and I was also like very recently sober. So it was like, kind of a whirlwind um uh but the thing is like so we've been together 13 years and in those thir 13 years obviously like we've changed as people um you know we were we were really young and when we did that um and obviously my more spontaneous and uh, people at the time because like we would never do anything like that now we're so square um but for for them it's like it's not like i it's not like one day i was like surprise i'm trans <laughs> like he knew for a long time um what was saying it or not uh and 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 there were like there was a period where I was sort of like testing the waters of, of my transness by being like, I'm queer and I'm bisexual. And I know that my sexuality isn't straight and I like doing drag and, and like, and he's just always been on board. He's always been on board. So when, when the, um, when the discussions of top surgery and, and hormones started to come up, you know, he was I, I don't want to speak for him because I, I actually, I, I guess I can't understand what it must be like. Um, but are you guys still together? Someone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and I, and I also know that that's, that sometimes doesn't happen, right? Where when you do 
reveal that you are it's it's time to be who you really are that your partner is like well but that's not that's not how my sexuality works which is you know it's i i think it's really tragic and painful but um that's sometimes how it goes for him though you know he's always just been like you are who you are and that's who i love and and also like, I get to wear all his clothes. <laughs> so a lot of like my experimentation into wearing something different uh, than what I was like typically used to was just dipping into his closet with permission. And, and he's great. I mean, he's always like, now when I get dressed up to go out and I'm wearing like a suit that like used to be his suit, he, he's like, oh, you're, you're such a you're my cute boyfriend. I love my husband, you know, like whatever, like it's really, really great. Yeah, I know. Right. Um, He's a sweetie pie. It's always good to hear good stories. It's always good to hear the good because that's always, that's when I try to promote the good, but um, and this is the part of the show where people who are watching this from the, from our city that we currently reside in, who are going to yell at me and send me nasty emails. Calgary is a quote unquote progressive city. They try to pass themselves off as a progressive city. We live in one of the most conservative provinces in Canada. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Coming out uh, as queer, as non-binary, as transgender is a challenge in a more conservative province. Mm -hmm. have you had to hide yourself since you've started the process of coming out of transitioning because of the province you live in and the city you live in? Well, again, I think similar to how my industry works, I think how this province fun functions just delayed everything, really. It was like, I just, I, I saw how other people were treated you know, there was a show that I, I hosted because uh, I'm an I'm an MC uh, for like burlesque and dragon cabaret and whatnot. And we, uh, a, a group of performers and I were in a small town just south of here. Um, and we were playing like the, at the Legion or something. You know, like we'd been hired by somebody to do this like community party or New Year's thing, and. Uh, and I made some kind of joke about the Kardashians. And I, all I did was mention Caitlyn Jenner and, you know, trigger warning, but the, the, this group of guys from the back yelled, his name is Bruce um, and proceeded to get really aggressive with me as the host like antagonistic and aggressive and they were wasted and we actually i remember getting off stage between sets and us like planning our escape plan because we were concerned that they were going to attack us um so that that and that's representative of um i'm gonna i don't think it's the majority of the people who live here. I actually think it's just a loud minority. It's just that because, because the loud minority often wields a great deal of political power, whether it's, it's actual positions of political power in our provincial government or, um, or our municipal governments, like you know, they have the backing and support of like the Proud Boys and they don't even act like that's a problem. Um, so do I think that, uh, overall everyone in this province is a white supremacist? No, but I do know that quite a few people hold some really like questionable centrist perspectives where they kind of straddle the ultra, um, uh, concern. I'm not sorry. I shouldn't say ultra conservative. Literally being like white supremacist, yeah. like alt right, proud uh, extremists. Boys. Yeah, yeah. And then some moderate conservatism, where they're like, "Oh, I'm fine with gay people and trans people. I just don't want to hear about it. I don't want to shove down my throat," which is like literally not what's happening. And then you've got like another minority who, who are actually like, 
oh, I, it, you know, queer people are great. They're part of our community. We need to support them and love them, whatever. So it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a unusual, spectrum like sexuality. It's, it's a spectrum. Um, but as I said, I think part of the reason this province is so conservative is just that those, those um, extremists um, are for some reason, they're really given this like mega free pass, right. To, to just exist as they are to run for, for government, um, then to win our provincial government. Cause I'm straight up saying that the UCP is like a white supremacist party. Um, I think they've shown over and over again that they, they don't mind courting the alt-right at all. Um, particularly during the pandemic. Um, and I, yeah, I know. Are you going to get, are you going to get some emails now? <laughs> oh, I've, I, if, if, if anyone's ever listened to the show, they know that my, my love for the Kenny government does not go that far. I had my cancer surgery canceled at the beginning of the summer due to the fact that open for oh summer was God. more important than surgery. So <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, among all the other like heinous things that he's done, he has also like his family is associated with um, trans uh, uh, gay conversion therapy, gay conversion therapy. Right. So he's he's certainly made his perspective clear um, on what he what he what he's willing to do and what the party is willing to do to squash you know basic human rights. I, I, I'm just keeping cautious of time because I know you have to get back to your uh, auditions or your uh, um, rehearsals here. No, we're um, we're good. We're good. Okay, I want to I want to I want to talk about the future because you you mentioned that you were going through you were on the waiting list now, if I'm not mistaken, you were on the list for top surgery. I was, though I did actually circumvent that, and I. I did a GoFundMe to raise money for a private surgery, even though it's also been delayed <laughs> because of the pandemic. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a whole other thing where we were waiting like years and years and years. And with the COVID delays, like trans-affirming surgery is now like five or six years down the line versus three or four. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it, it sucks. <laughs> Will that make you happy? Well, no, <laughs> because... no, because, because and, and I asked that question. I know that that's, I, I kind of sprung that upon you. I should have did some preamble to that, but you talked about seeing the person in the mirror. Yeah. You're, you're not sure who that person in the mirror is, even when you're on hormones, when you're going through the process, will the person on the other side of the mirror be different or will it be someone that you can look at and say, that's who I am? If once you get that surgery, do you think? I th it, it is, because part of it is looking at myself and actually seeing the person that I have wanted to see, but it's also <clears throat> the feeling of, of not having breasts. It's like the, just the general feeling. Um, I think it will make me happier. I know that statistically, you know, there's, it's like a point something, something, something percent are like, oops, no, nope, that wasn't actually what I wanted. Like the, it's negligible. Yeah. The percentage of people who, who don't like the after effects is negligible. So I, I, I can rely on that knowing that my feelings about my body are, are valid and real and that changing it uh, will significantly change my perspective on myself. Because I think it's hard for people to understand because body um, dysphoria and dysmorphia are so closely tied together often with the trans, trans experience. And um, it's, Oh, I had a thought there and then I lost it. But, but the thing is like, we, 
the the things that I say to I say to myself about my chest in particular are extraordinarily unhealthy. And I have tried for years and years and years to be like, like, oh, I'll be body positive. Oh, I'll start doing burlesque I'll, I'll, uh, and striptease. I'll make myself just sh- showcase my body over and over and over again to kind of like uh, encourage myself to love my body and, uh, and all of that. And I was able to do all those things. Um, but it's, I, I don't know how else to describe it for myself, but in my own experience, it's just that that part of my body has never felt like it was actually mine. It feels like it belongs to somebody else or that it belongs somewhere else. They feel like a foreign thing on me. And, and I, like I said, I've tried all these different methods of like self-love and body positivity and they all, none of them work and none of them have worked. And I just came to realize that, you know, it's not me. I'm not just being extraordinarily cruel or critical of myself. I, I really have an actual, um, uh, you know, like I have an actual and real and valid uh, trans experience that is causing me to hate that part of my body so, 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 so much. Because I think everybody can kind of be like, oh, I don't like my everybody kind of has a thing about their bodies, right? Like, oh, I don't like it when I turn this way in the camera, or I wish I didn't have, I, di- I wish I didn't have a breakout or this ear is higher than that one. You know, we all have that, but it's so much worse than that for me than just like this thing that you kind of don't like. It's like, I hate it. I hate it. And that's, nobody should feel that way about their body, I think. So I'm going to ask a pointed question here as I've been doing all of this interview, but I'm going to ask a particularly pointed question. What would you tell your younger self, knowing what you know now, if you could go back and tell your younger self who's going through these thoughts of potential, I, 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 I don't like my chest where it is. I wish it wasn't here. It belongs to somebody else. Um, because you mentioned some negative connotations with that and some things that you've said to yourself that are just not helpful what would you say to yourself as a younger child about the transition process and the process you're about to undertake that's such a that's such a hard question for me to ask because i or answer because i um I wonder with my younger self, if I could, if I could visit that kid, like whether or not they would have a completely different experience if they just had like, you know, a trans ghost, like visit them from like the ghost of of Christmas future or whatever, like visit them and be like, that is a Christmas carol I would watch. (laughs) Yeah. Look, you're actually a a butch lesbian, you know, like, or something like um, it's okay that you love that polka dot dress, but news flash, you know, like, um, it, it's <laughs> that, that kid's life would be so different. Um, and I don't, um, I don't know exactly what I would say, um, other than whatever, whatever you end up choosing, whatever whatever you end up, wherever you end up in life, it's, it all matters and you matter and nothing changes that. No outside perspective, no um, social structure, uh, no opinion from so-and-so actually bears any uh, significance on who you are. Calgary, Edmonton, Vegreville, St. Albert, Drumheller, Medicine Hat, Fort McMurray, and Peace River. These are some of the communities this show has been heard in. By advertising with us, your advert will be heard by countless Albertans and Canadians. Visit the link in the show notes to advertise with us today. So the reason I ask that question is to follow up with this question. 
there are kids out there right now struggling. There are yeah. kids out there right now who live in conservative conservative households, who live in a conservative province like ours, who are having those thoughts to themselves right now, who are thinking, I I, I can't come out. I can't. I, I want to be who I truly feel I am in the inside, but every time I look in the mirror, it's not that. Talk to those kids right now, because you seem to have an amazing head on your shoulder right now, and you seem like you are in the, a, a, a spot in your life where you're happy. You are getting the treatments that you need to get done. You, need, you have a uh, loving husband. You have two kids. Um, you seem to, ha- and you, you're literally, uh, uh, you're going back to uh, performances for a play. You, you seem to have it all together. And I, I know that we, that's just with the, between you and I, but what would you tell the people who are listening to this right now and say, it does get better, but not that cliche. <laughs> yeah. I think that they need to know that there is, there is a life and there is hope outside of the, the experiences they're having right now. So even though there might, they might be in a situation where their school isn't supportive or friends or family that, you know, trans people and queer people are, everywhere. We exist across ethnicities, races, religions. We are all over the place. And, and even though I know, I, I, I know so intimately how difficult it is that I really believe that we will find them and we will protect them. And that's sort of our, that's our job. I mean, you and I, you said we're probably of the same age. Well, we're also getting to that age where like, we're, we're, we're heading into being a queer elder, you know, for our younger (laughs) generation. It's true. It's true. And, and, you know, one of the things about the, the trans liberation is that it has experienced these peaks and valleys over, over the years, right? Like Victoria, Queen Victoria, uh, uh, put into law all kinds of like gendered things, right? Which caused uh, the trans experience to get kind of like cast aside and pushed back. And then, uh, and then there, were, there was research being done in Europe and Germany that revealed something like 32 genders um, that was burned by the Nazis. And then once again, we, you know, we, it's like we got pushed back. Then the AIDS crisis killed off a large, portion of our elders so we didn't have the opportunity for those people to shield us take us in to uh, provide sanctuary in our gay and queer bars Um, and we and it's sort of like these lost years right that we we once again have to keep like um, uh, demanding that people acknowledge that we exist and that we deserve uh, we you know, we deserve uh, equality and, um, and equity and opportunity and love and respect above everything else. But now we are in, this is like the Renaissance. We are, we have, um, like I said, we have always been here, but we are, it's like a reemergence and we're here to stay. We're not fucking going anywhere. And, uh, And so, as I said, I really believe that if we're experiencing um, moments where we can thrive, our youth will thrive even more. And we will always find each other to protect each other. I could not agree more with that statement. Um, Ari, I want to thank you so much for this. Um, It's not often that I can do a week of shows where I get to educate myself, but also hopefully educate uh, some of my listeners and hopefully have some people who are listening to this understand that um, while you might see darkness right now, there are family members around you who love you and support you. 
And uh, I hope that this week of shows has shown you that while you might be scared now that you uh, get again to use the old cliche, it does get better and people are there to support you. So Ari, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It was an honor and a pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you.